The reading this morning is Friendship by Ralph Waldo Emerson. We have a great deal more kindness than is ever spoken. The whole human family is bathed with an element of love like a fine ether. How many persons we meet in houses whom we scarcely speak to, whom yet we honor and who honor us. How many we see in the street or sit with in church whom, though silently, we warmly rejoice to be with. Read the language of these wandering eye beams. The heart knoweth. What is so pleasant as these jets of affection which make a young world for me again? The moment we indulge our affections, the earth is metamorphosed. There is no winter and no night. All tragedies, all ennuis vanish. All duties even. Nothing fills the preceding eternity but the forms all radiant of beloved persons. Let the soul be assured that somewhere in the universe it should rejoin its friend, and it would be content and cheerful alone for a thousand years. Here ends the reading. I originally titled um, this reflection as The Sacrament of Friendship. That's a very serious title. In a world that often doesn't take the practice and the bonds of friendship particularly seriously, Friendship is supposed to come to all of us really naturally. You meet in nursery school or college or on a sports team or at a party and you just take a liking to each other and that's it. You spend time together. You share your thoughts and dreams. You go fishing, you go drinking, you share easy companionship and you hope that this thing will stick this affection and loyalty that constitute friendship. But as we get older, we may get better at the art of friendship as we come to realize how important those relationships are in our lives. But sadly, many adults come to believe that they don't really need friends. But we do. We really do. Friends have a special and unique role in our lives as witnesses to everything that we're going through. And I just think of like Alexa at this, Alexa's daughter at this young age, companioning her peer through this incredibly serious medical situation. So friends have that special witness to what we go through and they also have an objectivity that family members never really have. A good friend is someone who knows you beyond those roles that can be so easy to get stuck in. And you know what those are. Mom, dad, husband, wife, spouse. Where there is a true friend, there is someone who knows you as a self, unlimited by all those expectations that come with those other roles and the particularly those family roles. You're just you, and you are known and loved for yourself. I've always been drawn to the New England Transcendentalists. You might remember that gang of brilliant people who lived in Concord, uh, mostly. They did Ralph Waldo Emerson being kind of the epicenter of that social circle. Uh, Henry David Thoreau uh, living nearby at, um, at Walden Pond. Bronson Alcott, you may not know as well, he was Louisa May Alcott's dad. He was also a Unitarian and was really instrumental in um, teaching a new way of engaging children with faith development or religious education. It was based on listening to them. Imagine that, instead of teaching a set catechism, it was based on questioning and hearing them and, and listening to their questions and being with them in the questions. Margaret Fuller, a brilliant transcendentalist and writer. Um, but largely, I really love this group, not just for all their amazing contributions to literature and philosophy, but because they took friendship 
so seriously. And they practiced it with great intentionality and commitment as a spiritual practice and an art form. Emerson was a very shy man. He's known for his philosophy of self-reliance. That's probably his most famous essay. And he's often blamed for the excessive sense of individualism that many of his Unitarian heirs bring into their community engagement. He got, especially in the 90s, there was like this whole movement to kind of blast Emerson for all of his emphasis on self-reliance and everybody said, well, that really, that's really against community. But if we look at his life, it was full of community. He devoted a tremendous amount of time and attention to many friendships, carrying on dedicated correspondence over years, spilling ink over thousands of pages, mailed off all over Massachusetts and New England, and across the sea to England, where he kept uh, very, very serious correspondences with philosophers and literary figures there. He and his wife, his second wife, Lydian, hosted guests constantly at their home in Concord. And if you get a chance to visit that museum, it's a, it's a wonderful museum. And it was not unusual for those guests to stay for months at a time. So if you're sitting here thinking like, I can't wait for my guests to leave after two or three days, imagine what it was like, because people traveled a long way and it took forever to get there, right? Stagecoach and all of that. And so they would stay for months. It was, um, oh, and here's Emerson writing in his essay on friendship, a new person is to me a great event and hinders me from sleep. Isn't that wonderful? That sense of like being so excited to have that connection and chemistry with someone that you're actually, you can't get to sleep. It's like a kid and he admits to that. And that's just a wonderful attitude to have as an adult. The transcendentalists made extraordinary literary contributions crafted in solitude, but they relied on friendship to cultivate their imagination, to try out ideas, and to challenge each other. And I think that last part is something that is so valuable about our adult friendships. Because to me, it seems often that we think of friendship as something that should be really just comfortable at all times, right? A friend is someone that you can just chill with. You could just hang out with. And it shouldn't get too intense, or someone might have to back off, or in today's, uh, in today's parlance, set boundaries. And here's another one, uh, a new phrase in the last 10, 15 years, ghosting. Have you heard that expression, ghosting? It's when you have a relationship of some kind, it could be dating, but it often friendship. And you hear people write into advice columns, I'm an inveterate reader of advice columns, I love you too. And people describe really frequently this pain of being ghosted, of having somebody just disappear from their lives with no explanation, and they don't understand why. They say, we were so close for so many years. Did we grow apart? Did I do something? There's no explanation, so they have to live with that mystery. Well, the transcendentalists would never have done that. They would have sent 20-page letters back and forth and back and forth, intellectually demanding of each other, as they urged each other on to accomplishments, to publication, to the work of social reform, and to philosophical and uh, moral ideas that really shaped our country and this culture. They worked out their differences, and they weren't afraid to offend each other in doing so. If you read some of their correspondence, they're a little bit rough around the edges about why they haven't been in touch and how frustrated they get with each other. The fact that they lived in a world of books and ideas and had much less distraction than we do, of course, allowed them the time to do this, but it was really their ethic of engagement that mattered. They're, they took their friendships as seriously as they took their parenting and as they took their uh, relationship as spouses or as children or as members of the family. 
I think this is the kind of friendship that we can dare to cultivate today in spiritual community, even within the midst of all those distractions and all of those ways that people can be sloppy and unkind in relationships with the ghosting and the, and the not being honest and so on. I've always loved that the Quakers call themselves the Society of Friends because it lifts the title of friend to that elevates it. It, it. it names friends as special companions of the heart and the soul and the spirit. Together, the friends do so much more than just have a beer and hang out. And there's, I have nothing against having a beer and hanging out, believe me. But friends in spiritual community have a particular vocation of presence and of listening putting away the phone. I don't know how many of you were at Thanksgiving and there was a lot of scrolling going on. Maybe even at the table, did you, did you see any of that? Just you know, scrolling on the phone? Yeah, I mean, it's okay. Maybe you were the one doing it. Maybe even you were the one doing it because like, it's like, this is the only way I could tolerate this crowd. You know, I mean, that can happen. But in these special spiritual friendships, we really remain present without the distractions. We show up for one another in, with deep care for the ways that we communicate and why. We were not thrown together in kindergarten or college and managed to find a spark of connection that we kept going. Those of us who join in spiritual community and spiritual friendship were intentionally seeking a deeper approach to life for ourselves and often our children when we walk through the door of a house of worship Announcing, we were announcing our availability to know and to be known, which can be very scary, and to become that different kind of friend. It's always a touching moment for me in the uh, Christian scriptures when Jesus says to his disciples, he says, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. And what I think he means by that is, because I've shared the mystical connection to God that I've personally experienced with you, and you get it. It's not an actual quote. <laughs> That's just me, you know, my understanding of what he means. But this is what friendship can be, that our experience can be felt and shared together with others. We have a genuinely empathic connection, and we get better at it the more we practice it. In this time when there's an epidemic of loneliness, we need more comrades in that side-by-side -side position of accompanying, strengthening, bolstering, and looking ahead together. Ram Das famously says that we are all just walking each other home. This phrase felt especially poignant when I shared it um, this summer because we had just bid farewell to two dear church members that week, Ray King and Sarah Drury, and then another dear friend, Will Boynton, passed away soon after that. One of the joys of congregational life is having been able to share those lives and heard some of the stories of those elders and their long friendships with each other. Barbara Holinsky, some of you may have seen on Facebook, Barbara Holinsky lives in New Hampshire now, turned 99 last weekend, and some of us went to a party at Knights of Columbus, and she was remembering Will Boynton back when they were kids. And it's such a gift that she still has that memory of that, those friendships. I have been myself spending as much time as possible with old friends, four of us girls who were very close in high school, and my best friend, who has been my best friend since fourth grade. And we all wound up living in Massachusetts together with various spouses and partners and dogs and cats about 20 years ago, much to our delight. But one of us, my friend Kelly, has had a rare and tragic early onset dementia and is nearing the end of her life at 58. We couldn't have imagined in our high school days of easy friendship 
that this would be the trajectory for us. But over the years, we have made really dedicated practice of friendship, going above and beyond the chilling on the beach or the, you know, giggling over movies. We have really worked to be there for each other through all the ups and downs, the geographic distance, the changes of all kinds, staying close and acknowledging the importance of being chosen family to each other. And this is serving us very well in these particularly difficult last months and weeks. I think of the words of the Thanksgiving prayer by Robert Louis Stevenson, where he says, um, it's called prayer for my family, but it, uh, it applies to friends too. He says, we have been brave in peril, constant in tribulation, temperate in wrath, and in all changes of fortune and down to the gates of death, loyal and loving to one another. I am a woman who has been fairly intentionally single for most of my adult life, and I've always really loved that Jesus modeled community that doesn't privilege romantic relationships and romantic and married partnerships over friendship. It's always bizarre to me that uh, conservative Christians emphasize everybody getting married up and having kids. It's like, did Jesus do that? Because I don't think so. That's kind of weird of you. Um, so I've never understood that phrase when people say, oh, they're just friends. Just. There's no just. There's just friends. It's not a con friendship isn't a consolation prize for romantic or erotic love. It is just as transformational and important to be a friend as it is to have any other kind of intimate partnership. We are family. We are family. Ba -na -na -na. That Sister Sledge hit from 1979 became an important anthem for the LGBTQ plus community. It's a great party song, but it's also a celebration and a naming of the way that people find each other and give each other the nurturing that they often didn't get in their families of origin. And this has been especially true for LGBTQ people. When we hear the term soulmate, we can think about, yeah, you know, the romantic soulmate that we're all kind of taught by Hollywood is out there. But think about what Aristotle said 2,400 years or so ago. Said, he said that friends are one body in two souls. And that's not just a beautiful poetic notion, but it's an idea affirmed in our religious tradition that we are part of an interdependent web of existence. Our friends are those we find shining within our travels in that web. They are special blessings and companions to help us navigate and make meaning as we live our stories. So just quoting Emerson one more time, I awoke this morning with devout thanksgiving for my friends, the old and the new, shall I not call God the beautiful, who daily showeth himself so to me in these gifts? So I'd like to invite you now, as you've been thinking about friendship relationships in your life, to enter a spirit of meditation and just get really extra comfortable and centered where you are in your chair. Get your feet grounded on this beautiful wooden floor connecting to the earth. And relax your stomach and your shoulders and your head and your legs and just bring a couple of lovely slow breaths up from the ground up through your body. And as you do now relaxing, bring into your mind all of the friends who have especially shown soul for you, who have especially brought forth your heart and your soul.
Maybe you hear their voices. Maybe you see their faces. You can smile. The trustworthy ones. Some of them are human. Some of them may be animals. Those are also dear friends. Some of those friends may be elements of the natural world that you feel have especially befriended you. Some of those friends may be people you've never met. Authors, poets, artists, athletes, whose achievements, whose work, whose contributions, social justice, profits, leaders of spiritual movements. These are people who have provided beauty and inspiration to you in your life. As you bring all of these friends into your consciousness, Draw ever more deeply into your being, into yourself, the gift of their being. And know that when people think and call to their own hearts, dear friends, that you may be among the beloved face that they conjure. And so we live in this ether of shared and received love, understanding, and inspiration. In times when you feel despairing and lonely, when you feel bereft, when you feel misunderstood, and uncompanioned, know that you may always return to this moment, settle yourself into this embrace of friendship, and feel renewed connection and strength. The Arabs used to say, when a stranger appears at your door, feed him for three days before asking who he is, where he's come from, where he's headed. That way, he'll have strength enough to answer. Or, by then you'll be such good friends, you don't care. Let's go back to that. Rice? Pine nuts? Here, take the red brocade pillow. My child will serve water to your horse. No, I was not busy when you came. I was not preparing to be busy. That's the armor everyone put on to pretend they had a purpose in the world. I refuse to be claimed. Your plate is waiting. We will snip fresh mint into your tea. As we go forth from this time together, let us find the friendship and care that sustains in our human relationships and also our kinship with the natural world. May the love that makes life meaningful be with you now and always, and peace be with you. Let the people say, Amen and Amen.